we welcome you to the Tennis Worthy Podcast, presented by the International Tennis Hall of Fame. I'm Brett Haber, and we are back for a conversation with eight-time Grand Slam champion and Swedish tennis legend Mats Vilander. My whole thing was, okay, he's younger than me, I'm not losing. That was kind of like, I don't care if he's ranked two or three or I'm one. It was always like, okay, he's younger than me, I can't lose to this guy. Taking a two-handed backhand early on the rise, I don't think that was invented much earlier than when I started doing it, to be honest. During the time I was walking up, I was trying to figure out, okay, what, what's the next move? Because I don't want to win like that. I want to win, for, not for other people, for anyone, but for me, I want to I win the last point properly. There's nothing more important than the game, because that game has proved to build character and build Arthur Ashe and Billie Jean King. Where'd they come from? From playing tennis. In 1982, Mott took the tennis world by storm when he won Roland Garros at age 17. At the time, he was the youngest male player to ever win a major title in singles. In this Tennis Worthy episode, Mott's and host Chris Bowers discuss Mott's mental toughness during that memorable run and also take us behind the scenes on his incredible display of sportsmanship at match point in the semifinal that year. Mats was inducted into the Hall of Fame in 2002 alongside Pam Shriver, and he shares his emotional memories of the experience. He also reflects on his legacy, his love of the sport, and how he enjoys the sport today as a commentator. I'll leave you now with host Chris Bowers and Mats Vilander. Chris, take it away. Mats, what quality do you think makes you a Hall of Famer? I think the quality that I have first of all started at a very young age which was basically um i qualified when i gave away the match point in the semi-finals in 1982 to jose luis clerk when we replayed that point i think that qualifies uh, me beyond my my grand slam victories and i think because of that i think i could have most probably gotten in even if i only won one because I think that's what Hall of Fame, what Hall of Fame means. It's, it's the opposite of Hall of Shame or the Wall of Shame, basically. And I think you don't have that with every player. I'm sure that everybody has, everybody has their good sides and their bad sides, which I do too. But one of my good sides be- became public. And I think once it becomes public, then you must probably have to take that into con- consideration. If I needed another box to be ticked to get into the Hall of Fame. So I think that's, that qualifies me uh, because over the years, I think I've been known as a fair player. And I think over the years, I have realized that I am a very fair player. Did I ever change every call that I, th- I thought was, was against my opponent? No, not at all. In fact, at the day after that, I kind of stopped because my brothers told me, that, yeah, it's cool that you do it, but they have umpires and they make mistakes. It's not, you can't help that. You can't change that. So it was just happened to be on a very specific situation. So I think that a Hall of Fame career has to do with what you contribute to the game. And I think that I contributed um, that honesty is a very, very high, most probably the highest importance when it comes to pursuing tennis as a as a club level sport, amateur sport, junior sports, because obviously in most place, most cases we call our own lines. And then I think that what, what, what would have qualified me otherwise is most probably that I managed to win a major on each surface. Now, obviously, if you win a career Grand Slam, that would have qualified too. But I think that that also shows, I mean, it kind of shows that I was good enough to be successful on three, three surfaces. Well, that was my main drive, was to be a good player on all surfaces, no matter if it's indoors or windy or sunny or if it's a certain volley. So I put that very high on my list of things I wanted to accomplish. And I think my coach, at the, when I turned pro, John Anders Sjögren, was all about that, without saying it. He was all about, okay, guys, we're going to learn how to play on every surface. We're going to learn, we're going to play doubles. We're going to learn how to serve and volley. We're going to learn how to hit slice back, and we're going to learn everything. And, of course, the idea, the bottom line is that you're hoping that, it, that the results, the materialistic re- results come because of it, obviously. But I, but I, don't, I don't think that's, 
the, the goal and the, was always to be able to play on different surfaces against any opponent. So I think that's what qualifies me the most to be uh, in the Hall of Fame, to be honest. When you were growing up, you must have been in junior squads with other kids. Yep. Was there a point where you thought, Do you know, I hit the same strokes as them, but somehow I end up winning more matches? Well, uh, to be honest, that question came up. I was doing clinics for kids in, my, in Vekshe, in my hometown, and the coach for these kids, and they were like anything from 7 to 10. The coach was a year older than me. He was my best friend in my original tennis club. We played doubles together all the time. And we were the same level when we were very young. When we were 7, 8, 9, 10 years old, he was a year older. So we were always the same level. And one of the kids said to him, so he said, so coach, how come you didn't win all these tournaments but Mats did? We looked at each other and we're like, that's the question that we need to find the answer to. Because it has nothing to do with strokes to a certain degree. And I don't know. I don't have the answer. I don't have the answer. I think one of the answers is that I had to f not fight physically, but I had to fight to get to the tennis courts, as in I needed a ride from my mom or dad cause, because we live uh, 20 minutes outside by car. So I had to get a ride. And often I got a ride with my mom or dad when they took my two older brothers, dropped them off at hockey, which was about a 15-minute drive, and then there's another 15 to the tennis courts, and then the person, mom or dad in general, dad would wait for me to practice my 45 minutes, which is all we got in, in, on indoors because we only had one court and we were 400 members and we must have been 50 kids that were within two or three years of me. And I think that I had to adjust. So I think the, the answer is, I think I was forced to adjust to playing on black asphalt in the summer in a parking lot at my father's and my mom's factory because they work in the same place. And then I had to adjust to then going to play on clay courts sometimes and then having to adjust to playing uh, in uh, school gyms where you play on wood. And then you have to adjust to going to the tennis club and you play indoors on Baltex, which is what they played on all the time. Indoors on what? On Baltex. Baltex is a carpet surface that's lightning like what fast. Boris, which what the Germans played on in Davis Cup. Right, it's so lightning like, fast. In, yeah, indoor carpet that's lightning fast. It, it wasn't for us when you're a little kid, you actually think it's pretty slow compared to the wood that you would play on in the gym. But I think that the only difference in, in us was that the kids that grew up next to the tennis club, they could take their bike, some of them walked. So it was kind of all up to them. So they can go whenever they wanted. Whereas for me, I couldn't take my bike because it was too far. So I needed to have someone take me there. So does that mean that they were pushing me? No, but they gave me the opportunity to go and practice three times a week, 45 minutes a time. But they wouldn't have. And I think this is where I liken it to what Nadal has done, which is I always thought when Tony was around, there was one main objective in Rafa's eyes, and that was to play his absolute heart out at all times on every single point. And I think at least it seemed like it to me that he wanted, he wanted his uncle to, okay, you passed today. You gave it everything, and that was the bottom line. Now, if you win or lose, that's irrelevant. So I think that what happened to me because of that, I think that I most probably took more responsibility while I was on court or while I was getting ready for it because I knew that I couldn't, can't do anything without my mom and dad. So I think that my values were different compared to the guys that can choose. You know what? I'm not going to go today or whatever. For me, it was... There was no chance. I'm going. Was it like an obligation? That's what I mean. The, I think the obligation was not to go. The obligation was to, if I went, which I did every single time, the obligation was to run to pick up balls when we ran out of balls, make as few mistakes as possible because I'm here. What am I going to do? So I think that, and that's just stuck with me because I have a, a pretty amazing ability to focus on hitting tennis balls when I'm on the court still. doesn't matter that I can teach tennis for five, six hours a day, three in a row, four in a row, and I can, I can literally focus on every single shot and I can focus on what I'm trying to do because I want the other person to have an easier shot and then I'm able to focus on what, exactly what I think they did right or wrong. So I think that focus comes from having decided early, and this is not even me deciding, just being put in a situation where I think I felt obligated to 
try as hard as you can all the time. And I think that other kids don't have that luxury because they had the, it was kind of their choice to get to the tennis. It was always my choice to play. I mean, if you'd lived two blocks around the corner and could go to the tennis centre on your bike, might you not have been the same? And might the kids who lived two blocks and could come on their bike if they'd lived 20 miles? That, that's, the, that's the one thing we don't know. And I'm trying to separate what happened to me. And I think that we need to, we need to find out what happened to Andy Murray and Novak and Rafa and Roger, just to name the, the men. Like, how, how did everything come, come about? What does Andy Murray's day look like when he was six years old? Did he, could he walk to the court? Did he need a ride there? Did he take the bus? Did someone grow up right next to the courts? And then how many times did they not show up for practice? Like, that's the book we need to, because I don't believe that you're born with it. I think you're born into it, but I don't think you're born with it. I think the environment helps you shape your mindset towards hitting tennis balls. Because you won Roland Garros at 17, did you have a transition from junior tennis to the full tour, or did it just happen? Well, so I, the first time I lost to a player younger than me was in 1984 at the Milan Indoors, and I lost to Stefan Edberg. And two I years played... after you'd first won Paris. Exactly. And he's two years younger than me. So I never, ever lost to, and I, I bet you you can go to a lot of professional players, and it's going to be a very rare achievement, whether, whatever you call it, that you haven't lost to a person younger than you. So that was my whole thing was, okay, he's younger than me, I'm not losing. That was kind of like, I don't care if he's ranked two or three or I'm one. It was always like, okay, he's younger than me, I can't lose to this guy. And that stuck with me till 84. And of course, then I realized when Stefan started beating me in that final, so okay, no, no, whoa, this guy, he's way too good for me on in indoors. So no, I don't think I have the transition between juniors and men, because I was used to winning everything as a junior. And then, of course, when you win the wrong hours, while you're still a junior, having won the juniors the year before, of course, that I had losses in the men's tour, but it didn't feel like there was that many losses. And the losses came to people that were older than me. Now, whether they were pros or not, they, he's older than me. So I was always able to justify that my my tennis was heading in the right direction because I'm, I'm keeping everybody younger than me behind me. And once in a while I stick out and I beat somebody that's older than me that maybe I shouldn't. For example, I beat Hans Simonsen in a $25,000 tournament in uh, south of France, in Royon. We had just won the, he won the under 18 in Nice in the, in the European junior and I won the, under, the 16 and under. So obviously he should be better than me. And we play first round the week after and I beat Hans Simonsen 0 and 2. But he's two years older than me. I guess that I got used to beating everybody that was younger than me. And when you're thrown in a situation on a tennis court where you're winning 95% of all your matches, whether you're 10, 12, 14, say, when you have that record and then you're thrown onto a court against someone who's older than me or not, it doesn't matter. If I'm thrown into a court and I feel that we are, wow, I have a chance to win here, the Guillermo Vila's intimidation factor gets thrown out the window. Because it's just two players now that are weird. Oh, I have a chance to beat him. But when you beat Villas in the 82 Roland Garros final, yeah. he was much older than you and he had the great reputation. He was 14 years older than me. No, 12. So he's born 52, I think. That's what I mean. So I lost to him a month before. I had no chance, which is why before the match, I was 100% convinced that I'm not going to that I'm not going to win. I was 100, not 100, nearly, that I'm not going to win a set. And I was trying to, literally, I was trying to win games. So I was trying to put one game on the board as soon as I possibly could, which happened in the first set. And I remember doing it. I'm like, oh, thank God. It was like, oh, thank God. It's not going to be 0-0-0. Oh, oh, oh. Because seriously, in those days against Guillermo Vilas, oh, it's like playing Rafa if you take the serve away. Rafa on a clay court and you don't have any free points because of your serve. Five years ago, there's a lot of guys in the draw that might win a game, a set, if even that. Because when you don't have weapons you can lose 6-1, 6-1, 6 and it's pretty close, but it's on the scoreboard, not close, because he wins all this. So I was afraid of that, and then, of that, and then I won it. And then I realized, wow, he's choking a bit, and we're now 1-all, 2-all, 3-all, 4-all. In the second set, I'm like, holy smoke, I can't believe I'm playing even with Guillermo Vilas. And once that goes out, I think for guys that have won when they're very young, I do think that there is a mechanism in your brain that go, okay, I have a chance here, because we're the same 
in level. Not he has four majors and I'm ranked 27 in the world. Tennis, we're the same. Now I give myself a good chance to not maybe win, but I give myself a really good chance to push this to the very end and most probably pick the right tactics along the way. Obviously, according to how what I can do, not go slicing and go into the net. So I think that's what happened. And because I won so much in juniors, the step into the men's was not about stepping into the men's. It was about stepping into a, another level of pros. And it turns out that level wasn't that much higher than mine when, when I was 17. You, when you watched a tape of the match, yeah. Vilas was sort of playing old school tennis. He was just getting everything back. He was happy to rally forever, yep. wait, wait for the opponent to make a mistake. You were actually, certainly as the match went on, you took the ball early. You took it on mm -hmm. the rise. Yeah. Almost like you were playing the next generation's tennis. And that actually completely undermined him. And the third set, he won six love. Yeah, no, 100%. That's what happened. I don't know why, because maybe because he... I think that the, the, what changed... And of course, Connors had the same thing, but Connors hit the ball similar on both sides. But I think, to be honest, taking a two-handed backhand early on the rise, I don't think that was invented much earlier than when I started doing it, to be honest. And also taking it on the rise and being able to go down the line. And of course, Vilas being left-handed, suddenly that's a great shot instead of going to the forehand of a right hand. So, And I do think that I was one of the first to actually keep the ball in play and then look for that shorter ball and then taking it and then sometimes follow it in or go forwards a step or two and then back off. And I think that I was able to shrink the court to the point where I can't hit it over here because Mats might take it on the rise. That didn't mean that I was going to hit any winners except the match point. It wasn't, they weren't winners. But I was t able to change the pace of the, of the rally with not power but just taking it sooner. And Borg never did that, for example. I don't know if Cliff Drysdale did it because he had two hands. I know Harold Solomon and Eddie Dibbs didn't do that. Rosewall did it with one hand, though, didn't he? Rosewall, for sure, he did it with one, exactly. But that was a sort of a slice, right? Or, a, or block a chip slice, or a block, yeah. exactly, more of a block. So I think that's what, that's what I think is what threw some of those guys off because Borg didn't do that. And I did it, but I hit the ball way softer than Borg. He hit the ball much harder. But somehow I was able to take some time away. And, I mean, that's the same from when I was playing juniors. That's what I did. Except in the juniors, you hit the ball high so the kid might not reach it. And if he reaches it, there's an opportunity to come forwards and do something and maybe even go into the net. But it was more just coming forwards. So, yeah, I, I'm not sure. But um, And was all this planned? Was this part of strategy? Did, did Deontay Sjogren coach you in this? Or was it just the way you played and it happened to be appropriate for beating big names like Vilas at the time? I think it happened to be appropriate to, to stay alive against those guys on clay courts. Because on a hard court, I couldn't. I played Landel in 82 at the US Open, played him in 83, and uh, it, there was not, I couldn't do anything on a hard court because they could hit through me. But on clay, they weren't able to hit through me. So it, what, was it planned? I mean, I played every single part in my junior career with a plan, of course. But that plan never had, you didn't have to perfect it. But against Vilas, you had to perfect it. So yeah, I was tactically um, able to do things that I was able to do because of my physical limitations, whatever they were. Let's just take you back around to the semifinals in Roland Garros. Uh, you've beaten Lendl, the favorite, in the fourth round. Yep. You beat Gerolaitis in the quarterfinals. You then match point in the fourth set against Jose Luis Clerc. What happened? And what went through your mind? So what happened was that it was 6-5, me, fourth set, two sets to one. I think we split the first two, I believe. I don't remember, actually. And um, the pattern was for him to hit a big serve and me not being able to get the ball over to his backhand, even though his backhand was also great, to step around and smack a forehand inside out. And there were very few people that can do that on the rise. And Jose Luis Clark, because he's such a, he, because he's the tall guy and he was strong and he had an extreme grip on the backhand, more so than Ivan Landel. He was able to hit it more like Gustavo Curtin. So he had a good serve, I hit something, and he ran around and smacked it inside out and it hit the line. And I remember trying to run for it and then realized, oh, no, no chance. So then I turn around and then I start walking over to the deuce court and then the guy says, uh, je sais much. Vilan there, and that was Jacques Dorfman. I'm like, what? 
So I even remember, I've seen a video, I even go, whoa, and then I start, then I stop. I'm like, what is going on? And then I start walking up. And during the time I was walking up, I was trying to figure out, okay, what, what's the next move? Because I don't want to win like that. I want to win, for, not for other people, for anyone, but for me, I want to, I want to win the last point properly because of the confidence boost. And of course, that was the first thought. And then when we start going towards the net, and then I started, I had this thought too, I'm going to spend the next 15 years in these locker rooms. And this guy is not happy right now, Jose Luis, because he was losing, he was losing it. And then, so I'm like, okay, so we, we have to replay the point. I can't win like this. Of course, Jose Luis was so shocked, I think, that the next, the backhand he hit after three or four shots in the next point was literally, it rolled up to the net. It was near like he gave up. So I thought I was going to win in, four, in five. If, if, that, if it would have gone five, I had that thought that I think I have a good chance of, of winning here, whatever happens. So there was a, like three or four different thoughts that made me do it. But the original one was, I don't want to win like that. I want to feel like I deserve to be in the finals. So it was as much as anything that you would have not felt good that night knowing you were in the final yeah, with well, a match point that wasn't. I, I don't, not that night, now. Like now, I want to leave this court and I want to win it properly. I can't believe this is happening to me. What the hell? And he wouldn't even allow the guy to check the mark. Well, Jacques Dorfman was an institution. He was an institution. He only did two matches a tournament. The one, semis and finals. Yeah, he picked one semis. Of course, Guillermo Vilas was already in the finals. And, and, you know, afterwards I thought many, many, many different reasons why I did it. I'm like, maybe two Argentinians in the final wouldn't have been that interesting. And maybe because Borg is not here, now there's a young Swede. That's a good story because I, I, I can understand how he makes the mistake, but I don't understand why he wouldn't go either go down and check the mark or let the lineup. So, so like, you why had, didn't they go and check the mark? So you had to persuade him. So it's well, I, basically yes, yes. I don't want to. I can't win like this. So how did you feel we when played you played two? How did you when you got all those awards for good sportsmanship? Yeah. I mean, did you feel okay about that or did you feel, no, no, I just did something normal? Um, I felt okay about that because it wasn't something that was um, unusual for me. If I always played the umpire. It doesn't matter. When I grew up playing junior tennis, the kid or the man or the woman that lost the previous match on the court that I'm going on to play, their responsibility was to go up and sit in the umpire's chair. So it's the same for me. So if I lost a match in the, in the Swedish Nationals and then on that court, so sometimes you have time to run and take a quick shower because they have to sweep the court because they were all on clay, of course. And it doesn't matter if the next match was in an under-18 match. If I was 10, 11, 12, I'm responsible for being in the chair. And, of course, often you might have gotten your dad to do it or somebody else because they paid you to do it as well. So you got paid, and the idea was to pay the kid enough to buy an ice cream afterwards. So you could give that ice cream, say, hey, could you please, can you take my... So I never grew up calling my own lines, ever. Never, ever played a, a match where I called my own lines if it was sanctioned by the federation or the club or whatever. So was that because a of that, I was always playing the... Of course I'm playing the calls. But was that a peculiarly Swedish system? Or... Yes, Yeah. very much. Okay. And I think it's the best system... I don't know why, because it, it taught us to A, listen to the umpire. It's in or out, doesn't matter. The, you know, it's like my, my brothers always told me that, listen, if your coach or the umpire says that the sun is not out today, because it's out every day, then the sun's not out today. Okay? You don't have to be correct here. Okay? This is what the, ch the chair umpire says. That's the story. This is what the umpire says in ice hockey. That doesn't matter if it was a penalty. He says it is, that's it. So we're playing by the rules. So I've always done that. I never, ever protested against any call in any match ever growing up, ever. And then, of course, when I get a little older, there were times when I was like, what the hell, you, you, how, how do you miss that call? For, for sure, of course there was. So I felt that when I started getting awards, which I always had no idea, I felt like, okay, that's cool. Because I, I I'm not saying I deserve it, but I know that I haven't. I know that I've never tried to cheat. And does that make you a better player? Does that make you mentally stronger? Well, it made you, it's made you easier to focus on your opponent, for sure. And, and to not focus on the opponent being, being a jerk because he cheats calls. 
So for me, of course there were jerks when you were playing in the juniors. Of course there were kids that were like, oh, this guy is a pain in the ass. And so if you were playing honestly and your opponent was cheating, you would still say, that's fine because I have the advantage over him because I can focus on him. Yeah, but that never happened because we didn't have that system. So I, even if the kids were trying to, to get a call their way, it wasn't. I never ever put it down to that the kid is trying to cheat. I would put it down to that the umpire is horrible. They saw the wrong mark. I would sometimes put, you know, say, okay, this guy's an ass because he's throwing his rackets and, and the next thing he's crying in the changeover and then his dad has to come over and tell him to stop or I take you off the court, that kind of thing. So I, I obviously played against bad behavior kids, but there was never that thought that they might be cheaters. So because of that, you can focus on their style of play rather than their personality. In America, it should do, be the first. I'm sure England is the same. I mean, the cheating that goes on in the juniors is absolutely atrocious. Well, they've got rid of the let serve because, because of, that, of right? cheating. Of exactly. People who were aged saying, touch their net, didn't it? Exactly. Some of it, obviously, most of it almost probably had to do with Borg as well. Because when you're growing up and you, are, you have seen that, I mean, why did all rock bands have long hair that came from England eventually? Pretty obvious. The Beatles came with short and then they became long. That's what, you have, that's what you are supposed to look like when you play rock and roll, is longer hair. And I think Borg being there, never, ever, ever, ever complaining, is, becomes part of your DNA as a Swedish tennis player. It, everybody didn't do it. We had crazy Swedes as well. But to me, that I was affected by the fact that he was not complaining ever about anything so you just grow up with, okay, so it's not even, it's not even in the cards to complain or throw a racket because he doesn't do it. So, so it was never even a thought. So, oh, I mustn't throw my racket. That, I never, ever thought that either. Mustn't throw my racket. Mustn't. It's just like. Borg had long hair and you didn't. No, I did. Early on, I did. In fact, the first Davis Cup match I played, I, I wore a headband. And that was the first Davis Cup match that Borg did not play. And that was against Australia in Bostad. And I played uh, Peter McNamara the first day, who then became my idol as a, as a turning pro because of the way that he carried himself and because of his backhand. I love the way his backhand, and I even tried to hit forehands like his, even though his forehand was not good. But his backhand was, and I loved the way that he carried himself in the court, and, and, and we played a close match, and I played Paul McNamee, and I was wearing a headband for both of them. And then eventually I took the headband off. I kind of took... Borg's place, even though, of course, I didn't. And then the captain decided to put me into play as well, because we have Per Yatquist, we had some good top 100 players, and he, and he put me in. And, of course, the, the captain at the time then became my coach. It was John Anders Sjogren. I'm like, so it's two. So he trusted me in that, and I wear a headband, and then I never, ever wore a headband again. So for one weekend, I wore a headband. So you were the exotic Swede who everyone was interested in when you got to the Roland Garros final of 82. Mm -hmm. The following year, you were the champion and you were up against a Frenchman. Yeah. You were the villain. or I mean, you weren't the villain because that's not what you are. But yep. everybody in the stadium wanted him to win, Yannick Noah. No, for sure. But I didn't realize that. And I think that, it, to be honest, because of what happened in 82, they were actually generous in a way. I never, ever felt they were against me. Obviously, after 82, I'm the sweetheart of men's tennis in Paris because of, first of all, the, the point, second of all, beating Vilas, and then everybody goes back and says, oh, my God, he beat Lendl. I mean, I think I beat four players out of the top seven or eight in the last four rounds. And, of course, Borg wasn't there. So now there was another suite, so the vacuum was filled to a certain degree immediately. Now, whether people wanted that or not, I think they didn't like my style at all because it was too boring. But in terms of a personality of someone that they, uh, they, hooked, they latched on to my, I guess, honesty at the time. And then Noah, he completely, I think it even fooled him on how much the, the crowd inspired him, adrenaline-wise, tactically, whatever. And... I did not get affected by the crowd, but I was affected by the fact that I thought it affected him so much. But I think if I wasn't, if I didn't do what happened in '88, they would have, in '82, they would have booed me for sure. And that never ever was the feeling. And then I think that what happened against Yannick, and the story that goes with it, which is my story, is that first of all, I always, I always claim to this day, 
that I've never learned more from a loss than this loss, and it's the one where I don't want another result. Like, I want that result. Because what I learned from Yannick's game that day and from him embracing the crowd is that I learned that. Learn, I, need, I need to learn how to slice a backhand because Yannick does it and hits it short to me. And I, and I have a forehand, but I need to start. Or I'm, I should consider using it the same way Yannick did, which is hit high forehands to the guy's backhand, take two steps inside the court, and then either hit a slice, which I didn't, or take it early. So I learned that my forehand can become a weapon even though it wasn't hit hard if it's hit at the right time or pushed at the right time. And I would never have figured that out without playing Yannick. And then, and then of course, I went to see where he was going to celebrate as well. So I went into the locker room afterwards. He was sitting in this part of the locker room that's like a little room in Roland Garros that's gone now. And the French were all in there, I think. I was never in that room. So I actually went to that room and outside the room, there was a couple of guys sitting there and I asked them, do you know where Yannick is going to celebrate? And they said, well, who's going to do this and this and this. And then we're going to go to duplex at some point. So I actually went to the nightclub where Yannick was coming to celebrate. And he didn't, he only came about three in the morning and I stayed there because they were told, I was told the owner as yes, they're coming, they're coming. I wanted just to see how this man who had, first of all, beat me, because I was by miles the favorite to win, I thought, because I won Monte Carlo, it was a master series. Lisbon was a master series. I won another tournament in Aix en Provence, which wasn't, but it was another clay court. I lost to Yannick in Hamburg, really close. I was the favorite in five sets. I was convinced I was gonna not win the tournament, but once I got to each match, of course, McEnroe in quarters, I think. No, I wasn't the favorite, but it's on clay. I'm like, I nearly beat him last year on indoors in Davis Cup. So the further I went along and then with Yannick, I, uh, for sure I'm going to beat Yannick. And it didn't happen. So I think that's part of what that point did to me is that it, people in there, they saw me as something different, honest, but still somewhat of a personality that never said a word. And I think if you compare that to Borg, it was I was most probably lively compared to Borg in a way because he would never showed anything. But he had a reason not to show something because when he was a kid, he, he had a bit of a bad behavior. And I didn't have a reason. I did it because that was me and I was boiling on the inside. And then Borg set the tone, okay, don't show anything. So I think that the, the French 83 had something to do with why I then feel like I kept this nice guy honesty label for i mean you can imagine how many players have asked me about calls since then yeah i know what the umpire said i'm like umpire call it out man it's like, yeah i know Matt, but how did you see it here we go again so and i never ever changed another call never is that never. because of the reaction you had because i i'm not going to change the umpire is the one that's in charge and it's going to go both ways and it's not my place to change calls and first of all it makes the umpire look stupid and it's not what we do. We're, we're, the rules are that the umpire calls. So don't get on, go on and change calls because you're trying to be a nice guy or because you are a nice guy or whatever, you know? And this was such, it was a match point. I don't know if that would have happened, but it was too, it was too obvious that I needed to win the last point on my own. If it's in the second set, I bet you I would most probably not have done it because it wouldn't have changed things so dramatically. The way you're talking, it doesn't sound like, with the possible exception of the defeat to Noah in the Roland Garros final of 83, it doesn't sound yeah. like there are any setbacks. Did you have any setbacks? And, well, both as a yeah. junior, and, and how, what setbacks and how did you get over them? The biggest setback I had was after I won the French in 85, because now I've won one each of the four, four, four years that I've literally that I've played them. So I won the French in 85. I lost to John McEnroe. I lost first round in Wimbledon to Zivojinovic on center court. And then, of course, I lost to McEnroe here at the Open, five sets on Saturday. And then I had the same week that I lost to John here, a couple of days before, I met my wife in New York at the U.S. Open. So having won four, not before my 21st birthday, but the, those are the facts, but having won four, one each year, and then I, um, of course, I lost to Edberg in the finals of the Australian Open as well in 85. And I won those 83, 84, and I lost to Edberg, and he kicked my butt. 
And instead of going back home from Australia, I went to New York. I went to see my, my future wife. So I think that was my biggest setback was that I couldn't, I couldn't balance both of them. And I felt that I'm, I have, okay, I've proven a point here. And I don't know who I'm proving. I think I was trying to say that I've proven a point to me. Because in 86, I wasn't interested in the same things at all. Like I wasn't interested in every single shot in rallies to have some kind of purpose. And I think it has to do with meeting my wife. Of course, falling in love as a 21-year-old, having won a major each of the last four years, clay and on grass. Never thought I was going to win on hard courts, actually. And then uh, won Cincinnati on hard courts, which I beat back in Orlando. So I'd done basically everything. I won Davis Cup a couple of times already in 84 and 85. That's it. So I don't know if I, if I proved a point to myself and I lost a bit of focus, maybe. And then, of course, I didn't win a major in 86, and I didn't win one in 87. And, and I, I only let it slip for six months in 86. After I lost to Stefan in Melbourne in December 85, I let it slip through the French Open, where I lost to Andrei Chesnikov on court one, like 3-2-2. Two, and two. Horrible. Sometimes didn't really try that hard. Then I got hurt. I played Wimbledon anyway, beat Sherwood Stewart. He was qualified. He was 41 years old. I don't even remember what happened at the U.S. Open. So I had six, seven months when I, when I could have gone away from the top. And, and yet, for some reason, I met Matt Doyle, and he explained to me that if you get a little stronger physically, you're going to add this many miles per hour on your forehand, backhand serve. You're going to be stronger at the net. You're going to jump higher. Your second serve is going to be. And um, and I bought it. I'm like, oh, really? You think? So it's fitness rather than slice backhand, because you worked. yes, it was strength, physical strength, and I would have never met Matt Doyle unless I was interested in the future of the game, because I was the vice president of the ATP at the time, and he was the president. So again, I'm like, okay, so doing good deeds brought me to actually sit down before board meetings and have a couple of beers with Matt Doyle, and of course a couple of beers after the board meeting with Matt Doyle, because he's the Irish American and. That's what we did. Discuss the topics of the board meeting at the bar afterwards or before for a beer, not but a beer and an a beer. After. So again, I'm like, oh, OK. So because I wasn't complete self-absorbed, but I actually said yes to when they asked me if I wanted to be the vice president or on the board, because I would have never volunteered for it. No waste. But as soon as they asked me, there was no waste to say no. So again, it's the same thing. I wouldn't have met Matt Doyle if it wasn't for me actually being not a nice guy, but I felt responsibility because I'm on tour and I'm making money. They're asking you to do it. Well, then you got to do it. It's not my own t- it's You got to do it. So I think all of those things is why I think that I have a Hall of Fame career because I've always followed and tried to be fair on the court. I've tried to be as serious as I possibly could. And of course, sometimes even I was not serious on every point. Of course, I tanked at times, but it was never a tank that would be, that would put a black mark on the game. Maybe on me a little bit, but no one would know that. But I, yeah, there's times when I'm like. So you were trying to be a citizen of the game? Yes, exactly. Exactly. And that's, I think, is the answer to your first question. And I still am. I'm trying, I know that in here, I, and this is why I've been able to go out and say things about even Roger Federer that might not have been the nicest words, but because to me, I'm, there's nothing more important than the game. It's not Federer or Nadal or Djokovic or it's, there's nothing or no one that comes even close to being as important as the game that's played inside the fences, over the net, inside the lines, because that game has proven to prove to build character and build Arthur Ashe and Billie Jean King. Where'd they come from? From playing tennis. So do you, do you see your TV work as part of your citizenship of tennis? Absolutely. Yes, 100%. I'm trying to give back as much as I can. I'm not going out on the... I don't, I don't go out and do things that I don't want to do. For example, I don't social media. You know, I could... Man, I could put Instagram posts up every day with something, oh, I interviewed Nadal yesterday. I ran into whoever, whoever, Usain Bolt the other year, we did an interview, and I don't do that. Because to me, it doesn't belong with tennis. It's a complete different, and I might be wrong, and I might be stubborn, whatever, but to me, it's not, it's going too far. For me, it's like, it's what happens on the court 
the way that they apply their ability to what's happening inside the lines over the net. That's the only thing I care about, really is. So you talk about at the end of 85, you met this young woman, Sonia. Yeah. You get a bit distracted. At yeah. the end of 87, you marry her. Yeah. At the, beginning the, of it, beginning of 87. Beginning of 87. Yeah, January 87. Okay. And you had the most wonderful year in 88. Mm-hmm. And you were never quite the same again. So... Well, I had an unbelievable year in 87. That's what people don't realize. He just didn't win any slams. Yeah, I won two finals, French and US, lost to Lendl, finals at the Madison Square Garden, lost to Lendl. I won Monte Carlo, I won Rome. I believe I won Cincinnati, and I won a couple more times. So, I mean, I was number two in the world for sure after 1987. And then it just got lucky that I beat Cash in Australia because they could have had the same year again. What, in fact, in, in fact in, if Cash doesn't beat Lendl, I will most probably lose to Lendl in Australia as well. What, the first final at Flinders Park? Exactly. And if, that, if I don't win that final, there's a very good possibility that, OK, I might win the French. But I'm not sure that I'm going to have enough confidence to win on hard courts. But because that just fell into my lap and I got lucky, Cashy still today, to this day claims that there was a really bad call in the fifth set. And I'm like, mm, yeah, but they're all Australians. Like, was it was it a bad call? I, it's close enough where it could have been a bad call. It's very possible. But and again, said, out. Okay, I'm not looking at the mark. The guy says out, it's out. You said earlier that you thought you'd never win a, a Grand Slam on hard court. Yeah. You won that one, five-set final against Cash, which yeah. the Europeans were able to watch over breakfast because it took so long. Yeah. And then you won the US Open against Lendl, which took you to world number one. What had made the difference? What had allowed you to win on hard courts when you never thought you would? Because I was, I was physically stronger. I was physically a little bit quicker. I served a little bit harder. I knew I, had, I could get some free points on my serve. I always knew how to slice a backhand. Always, since I was a little... That's what, you, that's what I mean with... So the idea that I, you I, developed that in mid-career... No, is that no, 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 not at all. No, I always know how to slice a backhand because my two older brothers only slice backhands. So, of course, when they do, you need to, I want to slice a backhand. So I always knew how to slice a backhand. Of course, I got affected by Peter McNamara early on in my career because he sliced... His slice was too good for me to deal with, but, um, of course, I was only 16 years old. And then, of course, I lost to Yannick, which is another reason. And, of course, Victor Pecci being nearly the villain that nearly beat Borg, and he had that slice. Those, have, those things affected me big time. Roy Emerson came to teach us how to play doubles in Italy one year for the Swedish Federation. Of course, when you see Roy's backhand, you're like, oh, my God. So I always knew how to slice. We played a lot of mini tennis when I grew up with one-handed backhands, sliced, sliced the ball. But I think physically I was never strong enough to be able to stay alive with the slice and i think this year in 87 i get really strong 88 i kept getting stronger and i think against kashi i was coming in a lot more than normal and i learned how to stay alive with the slice backhand coming into the net on regular shots not a high looping forehand so i think i felt that oh man like i it's gonna be hard for these guys to pass me or it's gonna be hard for them to hit through me and I realized that with the Lando thing, if I hit a slice, it's going to skid and he's going to be able to have contact with his forehand maybe a meter further back or maybe more compared to if I hit a decent two-handed backhand down the line. And if I miss it a little bit, he's going to, he's going to have ball contact just behind the service line. So there wasn't even the tactics when I started playing the match. It was just what happened early on in the match that I'm, I'm hitting, slicing, I'm like, oh... If I go there, I don't feel any fear because that's what it's all based on, right? If I go high to his backhand, there's a fear that he anticipated and then he would slap a forehand. But when I hit this slice, there was no fear that, oh my God, wow. So it gave me room to, to breathe in the middle of the rallies. And then, of course, I won the first set. I'm not going to change now. I sort of serving and volleying sometimes. So... Again, that wasn't really the, the idea either, to serve and volley as much as I did. But again, that's my, that's my claim to fame is that I, I was, to me, in my eyes, I was complete enough as a player where I had ability to make a really late choice when it comes to what tactics I'm going to use. And of course, for people watching, they all think that I'm playing exactly the same, except that match. But it's not true. 
I play different and every point is different. It's just that I, I always tell people that, that you know, they say a shot, a shot maker, like an Henri Le concert shot maker. I'm like, okay, uh, why I'm not a shot maker? Just because I don't make mistakes. The shot maker is somebody that hits different shots. And my shots were trying to hit the ball high to the guy's backhand or hit it low to the guy's forehand. Just because they don't miss doesn't mean we're not shot makers. So I always thought that they don't understand, they don't know what they're talking about. But if you watch me play, you think all I'm doing is keeping the ball in play. And it's the same with Chang or Leighton Hewitt, but it's not true. That's not what they did. They were keeping it in play, but the next step up is they were trying to hit the ball in an awkward spot for their... So I think that's, again, why I'm proud over my tennis career, because I, I knew that I had this late choice, even after... Oh, you know, i got to change something right here. Let me do this. Uh, let me serve him volley, or let me take the back. Whatever it was, I always felt that there was a chance that I could change my tactics. And the feeling, that feeling was a feeling of freedom. Yeah, the safety net was always there. And most of the matches, I, well, yeah, I tried to change, and I lost them, of course. Having beaten Lendl in the final, the US Open in 88, yep. got to number one in the world, did you then lose that freedom because you yep. had a poor end of the year? You lost the Davis I won in the Palermo Davis Cup. the week after. Okay. But Two then weeks after. You lost a match you probably should have won in the Davis Cup final, and then... Yeah. Well, yes. In 89, I made quarters of, of uh, the French... Wimbledon, and I dropped down to maybe outside of the top 10 or maybe up there. So, But what did you lose from 88? What I lost was the ability to, f to do exactly what I was proud that I was able to do. I lost the ability to play the guy or to play the situation. Okay, this is not working. I got to do this. And I think I lost the ability to actually be humble enough to respect my opponent to the point where it doesn't matter if he's ranked 80 or 90 or five or two or whatever it is. I lost that ability to respect every player, every situation, every point. In fact, every strike, I lost the ability to channel everything into, okay, what, what, what the hell's going on right now? Like this last shot you hit. And Lendl climbed all over it, like, okay, let's get out of that situation. I lost the ability to, to channel my tactical thoughts towards what exactly is going on right now. Not yesterday, not tomorrow, right there. And I lost it, whether that's feeling the pressure of being number one in the world, or whether it's uh, a sense of uh, relief, or it's just a sense of accomplishment. Or like I said, well, where am I going? I'm, I'm number one in the world. Where am I going? Up? No, I'm not going up. I'm going down. You have to go down. So I, I don't know which one it is, to be honest. I have no idea which one it is, but it's, it was one of them. And then, to be 100% honest and fair to me, in 89, I had a good year. Quarters a couple of times. Lost to McEnroe and Wimbledon in a pretty close match. Can't remember at the French Open. And then my dad was diagnosed with terminal cancer in September of 1989. Died in May of 1990. And I was in Los Angeles because that tournament in L.A. at UCLA used to be played after the U.S. Open. And I remember getting a call from my brother. I'm like, what are you talking? Of course, we didn't know that it was that it, there was no chance of, but we found that out very quickly. So in my own defense, which is horrible in a way, it was like, what are you telling me? Suddenly, everything else became way more important than my tennis. And of course, that little th that little situation when I'm trying to channel my that situation didn't exist anymore. That, that, I didn't even know how to label that situation that you mean, I, I used to care about every shot against every player, first round to the last round. I didn't even know how that feels. I don't, still don't know how that feels. At the end of your career, you won seven singles Grand Slam titles, yeah. three on clay, two on hard, two on grass. Yeah. You won the Wimbledon doubles, but you never won the Wimbledon singles, yeah. even though one of your grass court titles, including beating McEnroe in the semifinals in Melbourne yep. in 83, when McEnroe was absolutely the peak of his right. uh, game. Yep. Sure. Do you feel you're underestimated as a grass court player because you never got beyond the quarterfinals of the Wimbledon singles? Not really. Not the style that we had to play. I mean, I was not a natural serving volleyer for sure. I knew how to do it. But Wimbledon, kind of, no, not, not really. I mean, the, the, a natural grass court player can make the change straight away from clay to grass. 
just by suddenly, okay, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I need to do here. And I don't, I didn't believe in the tactics of serving and rallying on both sides. I just did it because that's what I have to do. We had to do that. In but was that different in Australia? Yeah, in Australia, so, so in Australia, we usually spent at least a month on grass. So then you become, it becomes naturally, and now your ground strokes are so crap because the courts are not great. So now it becomes, I always thought it was much easier to play in the wind and in the sun and, and, and sun in your eyes because there was another, because when you're choosing a tactics, there is a little bit of, oh, is this the right thing or is it the wrong thing? But when you're throwing wind into it, then oh, I think this is the right thing. And then, oh, of course it is because the wind's with me. So that in Australia made me then, well, this is what I'm going to do because this is what I'm going to be able to do the best is serving and volleying. Plus in Australia, the grass was, the courts were harder. So returning was much easier and you could stay alive from the baseline a little bit longer there. So I think that, but it was more of a sense of, okay, I don't have anything left. I've served in Bali for a month in Perth on grass in practice. This is a way I'm going to play because this is my best chance. And, and that has to be very clear to me. And it did, it became unclear after I was number one in the world and then with whatever circumstances that it became very unclear what it is that I need to do to give myself the best chance. In 2002, you were inducted into the International Tennis Hall of Fame. For a man who is very, very eloquent, you were quite sort of emotional in your acceptance speech. I don't, I don't even remember, but yes, I was. I was, yeah. So what happened is I got the call and... Of course, I didn't realize because I'd never been there. I didn't realize that you should have invited your anyone that's in your family need to come. And I actually told my wife that, you know, you don't need to come. You don't need to come when the actual award ceremony is happening. But it would be funny if you come the next day because we have a big dinner. So I'd love, uh, love to have you as a dinner, dinner guest or next to me. So what happened was that I went with three friends. One was from... Um, from Idaho. He brought his best friend from Connecticut that he used to grow up. And then I brought my best friend who actually just dropped me off here. He used to be my neighbor. I said, you guys better come. We'll go re really fun. There's a bunch of cocktail parties. We go play golf. I never had any clue of what it, what it means to be inducted in the Hall of Fame emotionally. Of course I knew that. So then you get there and then you see that, oh my God, they put a whole wall just for the two inductees, me and Pam Shriver. And the wall next to me, there's a little, there's a Rod Laver tribute, but his is only like this big. And mine was like 10 feet by 10 feet because we were the ones that were being inducted that. So I'm like, oh my God, this is like, wow, these guys are all, wow, this is kind of heavy. This is amazing. And then the time when I was there maybe two, three days before, and we did all the official stuff, whatever. And my coach decided to come and his wife, because he's introducing me. So I get to the so we get to the court, and then uh, I think it's Tony Trabert, Martina Navratilova introduces uh, Pam. My coach introduced me, and of course then we have our speeches. So I think we had the speeches first, and then Tony Trabert comes up and says either before or after the acceptance speech, it comes up. Okay, it's time for the friends of the inductees to please rise and stand up. So the friends sat on the one baseline and family and relatives sat on the other base, and we were over here behind the, by the umpire's chair. So I had these three guys, the three of them stood up like this, and I'm like, yeah, boys, come on. So there was actually before the speech, before the speech. I'm like, yeah, go, because for me, it was just like a weekend with my friends and the boys, literally. So then Tony Trevor says, okay, thank you. And now he says, now, please, can I have the family and the relatives of the inductees? Please stand up. And of course, they're all on that baseline. And I don't have anybody there. Nobody. And Pam Shriver had, I would say, anyone that had any genetic relation to Pam Shriver was there, including grandma, grandpa. So she must have had 10 to 20 people stand up over there. And I don't have anyone. So I look, so I'm like, guys, come on. So then they stand up again. And, and they were laughing. We're laughing their ass off, of course. Was probably had a you know a beer in their hand for sure, but it was not. And and then it became when I had my speech, I realized I'm so nervous right now. I don't know what to say. I had written a whole speech with the help of these three lunatics, 
the night before and I took that and I threw it out. I'm like, oh my God, I have no idea what I'm going to. So I, again, just, I uh, relied on my problem solving skills as a human being and as a tennis player. So I went up and I'm, I know it's horrible because the guys were like, what the hell did you say? Like that was the worst speech of, I'm like, oh my God. So then anyway, we do it. And then we start walking around the center court and that's when it hit me. Like, oh my God, this is unbelievable. Like, I'm even getting emotional now when I talk about it. Like, wow, other people have chosen me to be in this amazing hall of fame that honestly, personally, before I got there, I don't do inductions. I do you win or you lose. You win, I give me the trophy and the money and the ranking points. You lose, oh, you're better than me. Here, you deserve it. And suddenly you get chosen to do something. That was not serious to me at all. And of course, it didn't help that Bjorn Borg had already not gone because he never went, I don't think, to, for his uh, acceptance thing. So for me, International Tennis Hall of Fame was nothing. It was, I've heard of it, but I never win. I never know any idea. And it was like, I'm not a figure skater. You can't pick me and have, and have me emotionally be attached to, to your choice. Until, until when I started walking around, holding this, this thing up, and then, of course, we left. And then we started doing all these pictures. I'm like, oh, my God, geez, this is like, wow. So the first, I felt such a sense of pride and honor in my achievements as a player, but also because I did go to the museum and realize that, no, you didn't have to be a player to be inducted in the Hall of Fame. There are other categories. And if you're a contributor to the game, you also get inducted to the Hall of Fame. And that's when I put, that's why I think what hit me was that I put two and, the two, and two together and realized, oh my God, I'm in here for this but I could also be in here for this. And that just sent me, literally. And then it was just, and then of course, I'm like, call my, I'm like, well, I can't believe you weren't here for that. Because you came the next day, but I'm like, I can't believe you, I can't believe I didn't have you here. That was the most emotional, and it was. It was the most emotional I've ever been on a tennis court, in terms of feeling proud and feeling like, oh man, this game is so big and I am nothing but I'm now part of the, the foundation of this game in terms of my, my results, but more in terms of the, what, I, I, what I believed I stood for as a player. But it doesn't mean that I think other people think that I stand for the same thing, but I know what I stand for personally. And, uh, and you continue to be... And I try to continue yeah. that same. And it's not like I have to try really hard, to be honest. For me, it's sacred. It's like, going to, this is what you do. There's no... That's why, like, when they allow coaching and then when they change the rule, I'm like, oh, I don't know, changing the rules of tennis? Why we do it? Do we need to? And I guess we do in a way, but I, to me, it's not necessary. But I'm also not looking to, to tennis because of the popularity of the game. I would like as many people to play tennis as possible because I think it teaches you such a serious lesson in life. But I was also, I never understood that. Well, hold on, Matt, if you're more popular, then and more a role model then maybe more kids will play and then more people will take part of the lesson that you have learned from tennis but that never hit me like i never understood that part because that wasn't and when you play you're trying to win period and when you're not playing i'm just going to live by these rules that i have when it comes to tennis and it's still popularity to me is still like mm, i don't know that's why i don't really when novak and everybody always talking about him not being probably like, just my advice to Novak would be, be yourself. And I'm telling you, they're going to respect you as much as they respect the other two. But it might take you longer. But just be yourself. Keep fighting. Keep doing the right thing. I mean, we are respecting John McEnroe because of his perseverance. Not because of his, because of his patch of bad behavior for three, four, eight years. But we respect him because of the journey he's been on. And now he's part of, the, he's part of our very small family that adores the game of tennis. And so are you. And Mats Villander, thank you very much for sharing Pleasure, your Chris. thoughts. Thank you so much. Profound thanks to Mats Villander for his tremendous insight today and reminders of what makes tennis transcend sport and life. If you enjoyed this conversation, be sure to give a listen to our other episodes of the Tennis Worthy podcast featuring legends like Pam Shriver, Leighton Hewitt, Tracy Austin, and many more. 
The Tennis Worthy Podcast was created by the International Tennis Hall of Fame in association with the Tennis Radio Network. Thanks so much for listening. We'll see you next time.